Uh, hi. Good afternoon. It's noon, right? No, afternoon. Um, my name is Mick Bauer, and before anybody asks, I am not on my way to a Scottish funeral. Thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about self-abuse for smarter log monitoring, and um, it, it's a really a fairly simple technique, but I thought it would be a fun context to, in which to talk about uh, log monitoring and to talk about self-scanning and about self-abuse if you want later on. Um, the, uh, the talk that I'm about to give is reasonably well structured and I just wanted to show you that I am working off of an outline despite what it might appear later on because I do want to keep things fairly loose. I want you guys to have um, as much impact on the flow of this as you want to have. So comments, questions, observations are welcome at all times. Later on I'm even going to open up the floor uh, to uh, for people to beat up on my victim system here, and I'll give uh, the IP address of that when the time comes, although some of you uh, may have may deduce it way before then. And whoever causes interesting log messages to show up there will get a prize. Um, okay, so let's just dive into it here. What is the point of scanning yourself, you might ask? Um, well, security people like me tell you, monitor your logs. When you harden your web server and you configure uh, everything into a production state and it's working, you should not abandon it, right? You shouldn't just leave it chugging off in the corner. Among other things, you should be monitoring its logs regularly. Um, maybe you even want an IDS system running on it, a host-based IDS system. Uh, maybe you want a simple log watcher like uh, Swatch or Log Watcher or uh, Log Digest. But in all of these cases, you as a sysadmin need to know something about what constitutes evil activity. Would you know uh, an attack-induced log message if you saw one? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. Um, this technique can help. So, if I'm talking about running, let's say, Nessus or Nikto against um, a system and you're going to be logged onto that system and, what, and tailing the logs, um, there's a couple of assumptions at play here that, are, that, I, that I wanted to spell out. The first is that one of these scanners, the, the, the scanner that you're using, whether it's Nikto, whether it's Nessus, or whether it's just Telnet, you know, Telnet 80, and, et cetera, um, the assumption is that that's going to look in the logs pretty much the same as live exploits that kitties in the field would be running on you. I think this is a fairly reasonable assumption. Um, what a security scanner like Nessus does is it actually does the early stages of actual exploits. That is to say, it does this sort of very targeted rec reconnaissance and initiates the types of packet sequences that a full-blown actually trying to root your box attack would do. But that, is an as that may or may not be a leap for you. Um, when in doubt, there's no substitute for running actual exploit code against yourself if, if, that, if you want ultra-realism in this. Um, in, in my opinion, you know, um, the, using um, a general a generalized scanner like Nessus or Nikto is perfectly okay. Um, and then, so there's value uh, there's value in that in in seeing what kitty behavior looks like. Um, another thing that's probably equally, maybe even more important, is what if you run your all the stops pulled Nessus scan against your host and it logs like nothing? That's telling you something really important, isn't it? It's telling you, okay, time to go in and fine tune syslogd. Time to go in and maybe tweak the logging settings on Apache or whatever so that I'm seeing the information that I expect or want to be seeing when uh, the, the bad guys come knocking. And then finally, it's just good clean fun to scan yourself. Okay. Now there are a few limitations, um, not only with you know, this little technique, but also with um, log monitoring in general, and even I would extend that to IDS, and that is, um, I'm not proposing that if only you stay logged in long enough and frequently enough and watch the logs obsessively, you're going to catch bad guys in the act and lock them out of your systems. Um, I mean, that's obviously not realistic. I think that it's not realistic a lot of the time with IDS as well. Um, Logs are first and foremost a forensics tool. They let you know what happened. By definition, nothing is logged until after it occurs, right? 
Um, so if you really want, if you're really worried about proactive security, the plain old unglamorous techniques of staying patched, disabling and uninstalling unnecessary stuff, um, being aware of current trends in InfoSec, you know, what, what is the latest worm making the rounds and that sort of thing. And finally, knowing and understanding the security features in your software and in, in your operating system, these are the ways that you keep, keep attackers out. Um, this is a, a log monitoring, IDS, the rest of it. These are tools for knowing how good of a job you're doing with that other stuff, in my opinion. Now, there are things that you can do. Snort, for example, has got a, uh, an add-on called, uh, called Hogwash that can be used to dynamically reconfigure your firewall rules. Now, it says right in the Snort FAQ, and I agree wholeheartedly with it, that um, this is a beautiful opportunity for denial of service attacks. Um, if you know that somebody is, somebody is using something like this, if you send a bunch of spoofed packets from victim A, um, that it'll look like an attack. It, it, in other words, spoof an attack from victim A against the ho a hogwash or otherwise dynamic firewall modified type host over here, you, will, you can effectively prevent this host from receiving legitimate traffic from the victim host. Um, this is really the uh, fly in the, in the so-called intrusion prevention ointment. And there's various ways around that, and I'm, and I'm really not prepared to get in a big debate about it or anything. But um, other than tools like Hogwash, IDSs, IDSs are mostly for forensics, I think. OK. Um, does anyone want to pick that particular religious fight with me now, or, or should I move on? <laughs> I don't think it's really that controversial anymore. OK. Well, then let's dive right into a demonstration. Um, I'm going to run a Nikto scan against this box, which is running Apache. And give me a second here while I turn on a log tail. Okay. What I'm going to do on my main laptop over here. I've got a uh, Nikto scan all fired up and ready to go. And um, Nikto, if you're unfamiliar with it, is the successor to Whisker. Um, Rainforest Puppy stopped active development on Whisker. Uh, he's still maintaining LibWhisker. Uh, and he is, if you're interested in, in what Whisker used to do, you're redirected to, uh, not redirected, but encouraged to go to cert.net and get your hands on Nikto, which in fact uses LibWhisker. It is um, a web server scanner. And what it, what it uh, does, among other things, is it checks for known bad CGI scripts, known bad um, uh, sample scripts of various kinds, and a whole lot more. And um, if you're interested in command line flags, I'm starting it with a general scan. That, that's what the dash G is for. Dash N means no DNS resolution. Um, and then dash H tells it the target host to scan. So I fire that up, and at this point, I can skip to my victim. And let me see if I can't expand that a little bit. Okay. And ta da, that's what. That's what log output looks like on a machine that's being Nikto scanned. Fascinating, isn't it? I could watch this for hours. Actually, you know, I, you know well, that isn't the point. Uh, notice, though, what I'm seeing is a lot of repetitions of really similar messengers, or messages. Um, if I'm setting up something like Swatch, if I'm setting up something like Log Digest, I'm going to make sure that the string file does not exist is one of the things that I'm checking for, right? If I'm concerned about being Nikto scanned, if I'm concerned about people probing this web server for stuff. Now, if I'm only interested in a specific, specific uh, type of scan, I can, I, I can say, you know, grep for more than file does not exist, but you get the idea. Um, any questions? I know that's really deep and all. OK. Um, <laughs> Wait, oops. OK, there we go. Now, as you can see, this is back to, oh, nuts. Look over here. 
Oh, I wonder if the problem is the switch. Ah, uh, well. Oh, yeah, it must be the switch. Okay. Um, so as we can see, Nikto is finding some things wrong. And, oh, one of the things that it has found is that there is the Apache manual installed on here, which is default for SUSE Linux. When you install Apache on SUSE Linux, it very conveniently gives you the Apache manual. Now, that's probably harmless. Um, I mean, it's just a manual, right? But it has a little search engine in there. And the, the fact is that as a matter of practice, you don't want anything unnecessary installed on a production web server, right? So even something as innocuous as the Apache manual being there is still a significant finding. And this, of course, is the other benefit of this technique, is when you scan yourself, um, you will find out if there's, if there's more hardening that you've still got to do on the host in question. Um, I would like, if I could, to um, insert another demo here that I hadn't really uh, included on the slides. But um, before I do that, are there any questions up to this point? Any at all? OK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up that manual. Here, bear with me. And what do we got here? Ah, yep, sure enough, Nikto was not delusional. The, man, the, the Apache manual is running on this host. Now, there is a thing called Peros. Um, the Loft has an equivalent of this, a commercial product. I think it's called, or excuse me, at stake. Oof, my bad. Um, the at stake web security proxy. And what a web security proxy is for is for testing various types of web vulnerabilities um, at the pretty much at the application layer. And in other words, I can trap requests from my outbound requests from my attacking machine, monkey with them, and then send them back on their way towards the victim machine. So let's say I I, I click trap request on here, and incidentally, Peros is available. Oh, brother. I forgot to include a URL on this. If you um, do a Google search for Peros web, uh, web proxy, you'll find it really easily. Oh, wait, I know what I can do. Proofsecure.com. That's where you get Peros, or Paros if you're European. Proofsecure.com. OK, I have told Peros to trap the next request that passes through it. Oh, and incidentally, behind the scenes in my hotel room, I set up my web browser so that it's using um, it, it's using localhost colon 8080 as its web proxy, and that's what Peros is listening on. Um, I go back to my web page here. I type in some kind of wait. Let's do something that I'll see. Um, I type in a, a search string, click the button. Now the Netscape icon. Oh, I'm pointing at my screen. That does you no good at all. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, that Nets Netscape I uh, icon is spinning and spinning. That's because that's because Peros has grabbed that outbound HTTP request so that I can monkey with it. And we see down here in the bottom, in the body, I mean, here's my search string. Now, this is sort of a lame example, but what I could do here is type perhaps a much, much longer string than the web page itself will let me type in, in that field. So I lay in a whole bunch of Fs. And then I hit continue. Now if I flip back to my web server, OK, I got, I got an error message. That's good. That little search engine apparently has some kind of error handling. But if it didn't, Let's, if, the web server, if the web server froze up or something, that would tell me something about the, um, the security involved in that little um, search thing. So anyhow, that's Peros. If you're interested in web security and if you're running a web server, you really ought to, you really ought to be. I highly recommend this tool for testing 
um, web forms and web applications, um, anything that could be uh, vulnerable to um, fuzzing, which is what we just did, by the way, fuzzing, um, cross-scripting type attacks, you name it. Okay, back to the regularly scheduled program. Uh, okay, so we saw Nikto versus Apache. Let's dive right into a third demonstration. Can you believe it? So many demonstrations in such a short period of time. Um, oh no, why is this still logging? Oh, is Nikto still running? Must be. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, I'm gonna kill Nikto. And the, uh, site, the site for Nikto, by the way, it's in the slides in your program, but it's cert.net, that's C-I-R-T dot net, D you know, www.cert.net. Um, okay, good. Now, am I, st okay. Now Nessus. Now Nessus, available at www.nessus.org. Outstanding general s network security scanner from Reynaud de Raison. Uh, he gave a presentation at, I think, Black Hat a couple years ago. Heck of a guy. And Nessus is, if you are a security auditor or, well, anybody, it is just the coolest thing because it does what commercial exp expensive commercial security scanners do, but for free and 100% user um, customizable. So, in other words, you know of or have written <laughs> some zero-day exploit, right? You're not beholden to some vendor to provide you with, a, with an, uh, a plug-in script. You can write your own if you need or want to. Um, it's got a, a super easy to use uh, language for that, its own scripting language. Now, before I started this um, presentation, I logged in and everything, and I'm not, this is not gonna be a tutorial on using Nessus. Um, I've written articles about it. Actually, my book, I haven't plugged my book yet. Many of you are probably disappointed because I have not yet plugged the book. Building Secure Servers with Linux. You got chapter 10 from this book in your, on your CD, which might have been really dumb of me because maybe you feel no need to buy it now that you've got juicy chapter 10, but there's much, much more. Um, anyhow, um, in chapter three, I think, I talk about using Nessus as a sanity check after you harden a system. So you want de detailed information on Nessus, buy the book, flip to chapter three, okay. Um, so what have I got here? I set up a scan that's pretty selective. I disabled a bunch of the plugins that I know are completely irrelevant to this system, um, strictly for the sake of expediency here. Another thing that's cool about Nessus is step one in a Nessus scan is a big old hairy port scan. Usually, I mean, by default it uses uh, Nmap. Um, but that's really pretty time consuming. and you can, there's nothing to stop you from running your own Nmap scan, saving the output to a file, and then telling, it, telling Nessus, hey, I've already got scan output, use that. And what else have I got here? Okay, target selection. My target host is 10.25.25.2. And... Oh, in the interest of full disclosure, you know what? I misinterpreted that error message I got from my web server before. According to my, my log dump, the reason I got an empty page was because I've got a broken manual installed here. File does not exist. Serve HDDoc CGI local guestbook.cgi. That's pretty cool. If there are any invulnerabilities in that guestbook, they don't apply. <laughs> it's not there. I'm sorry. I, that just kind of caught my eye there. Um, oh, good, the screen back came up. Screen came back up. Nessus is really good about tracking sessions. So if if, if you've already scanned a host um, and and you had clicked save this session, um, then later on you can click on that on that session. And, you know, it's got a date and a timestamp and an IP address, and whammo, it will pick up where that scan left off if you interrupted it or rerun it whatever you want to do. I'm putting it in manually because I want to pretend that I haven't already scanned this box sideways. And, oh wait, let me show you the knowledge base page too. That's actually pretty cool. Um, Nessus can keep track of every, everything that it scans in a database. It's called the knowledge base. And 
So when you do subsequent tests, I mean, say you've got this, you know, web server farm, and you're going to you're going to scan it periodically to make sure that as you add web applications, as you add software, as you apply system patches or what have you, that you know that you're still that you're still not exposing yourself to anything obvious. You can maintain a knowledge base on that host so that basically what you do is a full scan and then incremental scans. Um, that saves you the the time and tedium of running the same scripts over and over and getting the same results over and over. Okay. I'm just going to fire up the scan here now, though. And now at this point, I'll flip back to our little web server. And since where I'm now doing a general scan, I'm going to tail var log messages. And if you see some really wacky animation, it's because I've got a bad, bad checkpoint driver on this system. Hold on a sec. Okay, and now we start to see some nasty grams. Oh, and some of them are even co are even coming from me. Better still. Oh, it looks like it's doing a port scan. Well, I'll be darned. Well, isn't that annoying? Well, that's going to take all day. Nessus is not without its quirks. Well, that's funny. I said, do not execute scanners that have already been executed. What the heck? Oh, well. Maybe it'll go real fast. Hmm. Now, it's worth mentioning that on my victim host here, these messages that you're seeing, the drop by default, that's not stock SUSE 8.1 behavior. I'm running uh, a custom IP table script on here, and at the bottom of the script, I've got default drop rules, and preceding each default drop rule, you know, for each of the three chains, input, forward, and output, I've got uh, a log rule that says log everything that's made it this far, and then drop it. So. Um, you're not going to see these messages, the packet level, dropped by default messages, unless you have done the same on your system. Um, a note about IP tables. Most of the major distros now have their own scripts for generating firewall rules. Um, I've really got a love-hate relationship with those. Um, sometimes they can be helpful um, if your needs match those that the distro developer had in mind. Um, I tend to do pretty zany stuff with my machines, and so that's seldom the case. I, te I, I tend to prefer to roll my own. Um, chapter 10 of my book, which again is on your DEF CON CD-ROM, so that statement is not in itself a pitch, um, has, oh wait a minute, no it doesn't, chapter 2 does. Okay, I am pitching my book. Um, chapter 2 of my book describes how to write IP table scripts for the specific purpose of protecting uh, a bastion host. I think that running firewall rules on a non-firewall machine is a really groovy thing to do. I mean, why not? Maybe you, as a web administrator, are more clueful than your local firewall admins. I've seen it happen. It's not quite as common as the reverse, but hey. Um, the point is that any system that is internet accessible should have some ability to defend itself, regardless of what the firewall that it's on the inside of, you know, does or does not do for it. So I've got some really simple rules that I'll inbound HTTP, inbound secure shell, inbound SMTP just so that people would see something something if they scanned it, um, and nothing else. Um, another thing that's worth noting is, naturally I have set my default IP tables policies on input, forward, and output to drop, right? So I don't really need my drop rules at the bottom, but they're there anyhow so that I can have the logging. Because your default, your default policy that you assign to an IP tables chain doesn't log. Go figure. Okay, um, so my Nessus, okay, it's beginning actual attacks. I, wound up with a, I did wind up with a much, much shorter port scan, um, so the knowledge base did kick in there. Okay, cool. I was beginning to question my grip on reality. I never do that. Um, all right, and now at this point, at this point, the weblog 
starts to get interesting, and we start to see Nessus-specific Apache errors. We're seeing a lot of the same stuff that we saw from Nikto, aren't we? We're seeing file does not exist, but then we're also seeing some somewhat more exotic stuff. Attempt to invoke directory something. It zipped by a little too fast. But there you have it. Nessus scan, tailed logs. I now have some idea of, um, of what ScriptKitty behavior should look like. And it's been on my terms, on my own spare time, at my own pace, instead of when the fur is flying. A lot harder to get up to speed on this stuff when the fur is flying. Any questions up to this point? Comments, jokes, coughs? No one's even coughing. It's creeping me out. Oh, God, they're alive. Good. All right. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, can everyone hear okay? <laughs> Dumb question. Never mind. <laughs> okay. I killed the scan because I'm sure that you get the idea. Oh, I guess here. In case you've never seen Nessus output before, here's some Nessus output for us. Now, I didn't even finish the scan, but I already found some stuff. What did it find? Oh, this is entertaining. I've seen this one before. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and to think I doubted that you guys were awake. Uh, okay, remote OS guests. This is a Panasonic IP technology broadband networking gateway. I had no idea. When I bought this thing, I thought I was getting a plain, ordinary ThinkPad. <laughs> Um, actual vulns, though. It did, uh, it did correctly identify an HTTP problem, and that is that it supports the trace method. Now, if I go back here, and I'm not going to do it right now, but if I go back in the logs, the, the log messages that correspond to that attack, I will see that this is, in fact, sort of a false positive. But there it is. Uh, something that's worth, that's worth pointing out is that... Um, if I let the Nessus scan go to its logical conclusion, I will see different, some different stuff than I saw in the Nikto scan. So, while it might be tempting to assume that there is a really well-known finite list of attacks that people think are noteworthy against Apache, there are in fact differences of opinion between the guys who do Nikto and the guys who do Nessus. It truly is worthwhile doing more than one type of scan against uh, a production host. If, if you're serious about, you know, uh, about checking your hardening work, knowing what, knowing what types of attacks to look for and that sort of thing. So I, f I found that interesting, um, that I got different results each way. Okay, I'm going to close the uh, report. Oops, not cancel. Don't need to save that. Back to the slides. Now, I've got screenshots in the slideshow on your CD-ROM. Um, now, it would be a lot more fun for you to reproduce these on your own, but if you're not inclined to, I've got, I show Nessus in action, and I show the log output. So now let's talk about loggers. Um, I've done these scans. I've gotten a feel for, for what um, scan activity looks like for some, pr some pretty granular, some pretty deep security probing, you know, way beyond just simple port scanning, actually. Um, and suppose that I have not seen as much as I expected or wanted to see. What do I do about that? Well, on most systems, you edit etsy, syslog.conf, most, on my, most Unix systems. What I've got here are the relevant lines, I've, that is to say I've stripped away most of the commentary from um, a Red Hat 7.3 syslog.com file. And as with Nessus, I'm not going to deliver a dissertation on configuring syslog. It's, it's all in the uh, syslog.com man page. Um, but just at a high level, what you've got on the left-hand side of the screen are um, log facility and log severity pairs. So you've got facility dot severity, right? And you can use the star wildcard. That, that tells syslog D, in any given case, what sort of messages to look for. And then on the right-hand side, it tells syslog D what to do with them, okay? I can write them to a file. So var log messages, I'm going to write a lot of stuff to. Um, I can, 
If I put a star on the right-hand side, I keep pointing to the screen. You can't see this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, use the mouse. Good idea. If I put a star over here, that says, write the log message to all consoles. Okay, now that's only useful, of course, if some sysadmin type, some sys administrative type person is actually logged on. So that's one that you generally don't want to do. Um, that's not the only destination that you want to use for any given class of log messages. You want to make sure that that, that that entry is redundant with other entries that write to files. And indeed, by default, you know, the Red Hat 7.3 syslog.conf file is. But um, you can also send messages to a remote host. And the way that you do that is by doing at sign and then host name or IP. And that'll send it to UDP 514 on, a, on your central log server. Um, my talk at DEF CON last year was about setting up a centralized stealth logger and using it in just that fashion. Um, it's real important that you have good logs and you have logs that you can trust. Um, which is to say, if you get owned, you want to make sure that later on when you go to analyze the logs from that, that you don't have to worry about them having been altered. Well, the logs, lo you know, the local logs on the machine, you have to assume that they've been tampered with. Um, your, your, your best hope at log integrity is having a copy of those log messages having been sent to some centralized logger so that you can use those for the serious forensic analysis later on. Um, okay, so here's a bonus. Um, this is a chart that was not included in my book. My editor felt that it was kind of confusing, but the thing is, it won't be confusing to you because I'll explain it right here in real time. This is actually like three or four charts glommed into one. The double lines, you know, separate the different parts. But I've got a list of the facilities that Syslog uses with their corresponding numeric equivalents. Um, I've got a list of priorities, you know, log levels, and their corresponding numeric values. Um, if you've ever tried to dig up this information in other places, it can be a little tricky. I don't think that the, the numeric codes are in the uh, man page, at least on Linux. Um, and then I've got a synopsis of the different actions that you can use and uh, the usage of different operators like bang and equal sign. So I encourage you, if, if you've got syslog daemons to configure, to print this out and tack it up in your cube. It'll save you a bunch of man page and info page lookups. At least that's what I hope. But I won't read every line on it to you right now if that's OK. <laughs> Okay, now for you Debian fans out there, here's a syslog ng configuration. Um, if you run Debian, I believe syslog ng is the default logger, isn't it? Or is it optional? Oh, it is optional. Oh, my mistake. But it's there. I recommend that you use it um, because it's a lot more powerful than regular old syslog. Um, syslog ng is also available on SUSE Linux as an optional package, probably on other Linux distros too by now. It'll run on anything. I mean, the sort you can get the source, source code <clears throat> from, let's see, www.balabit, b a l a b i t, dot h u, and the the home page is in Hungarian, but there's a little button that says English. You probably want to click that and then follow the links to syslog ng. Um, syslog ng is covered in depth in the sample chapter from my book that's on your CD-ROM. And so I will let that do the talking about syslog ng. Pardon the uh, jet plane. Oh, yeah. I just said that in a really Minnesotan way, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, sure. You can gaze upon that a little longer if you like. Yes? Well, does a kilt facilitate self-abuse? I'm not going to answer that question directly, but what I will say is that the sporan, which is the pouch in front, is the most practical accessory that a man can have because it not only gets all of your important stuff right there in front of you, but if you need to scratch, no one's the wiser. 
<laughs> I believe Jeff Rotel may have said happiness is a warm sporn. If he didn't, he should have. Yeah, I wanted to get the furry one, but that would be just too distracting. <laughs> okay. Are we done transcribing my syslog conf chart? <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Um, I worked so hard on that, and then they didn't include it in the book. I was miffed. I'm still bitter. Okay. So syslog ng, what, I'll, what I will say about syslog ng, about how it works is, um, you may look at this and say, God, that's a lot more confusing than syslog.conf. And it, it, you know, it's a lot, it is more verbiage. But it's highly module. You've got your option statements that are global options for the daemon's behavior. You've got source statements that tell syslog ng where to get its log information from. This one uh, on my site is actually kind of, um, oh, fancy, because I'm um, piping off a proc k message. What I'm doing is I'm doing an end run around k log d, which you really don't have to do. I mean, syslog ng and k log d work just fine together. But if you want to kill k log d because it's an extra process and it offends you, you can do so with a statement just like that. Um, you set up your sources, you set up filters, and that's where you specify your log facility and severity pairs and, and attach arbitrary text labels to them, F underscore weirdness, F underscore messages, whatever. Um, destinations, places to write the logs, terminal consoles, files, programs. Um, I, oh, I really should have put um, a UDP statement in there because that you can set up a remote host as a log destination. And then the payoff, the log statements, that's where you combine the other elements. And so you can um, reference sources that you've set up above, filters that you've set up above, and, and destinations in whatever combinations trip your trigger. So that's syslog ng, flexible, marvelous. Um, another cool thing about syslog ng, by the way, syslog ng supports logging over TCP 514. By default, syslog, plain old BSD syslog, only uses UDP 514. That means that it's not as reliable, and it means that it's not so easy to tunnel. Um, so that's a, that's a feature worth mentioning. What's the other thing I was going to say about it? Oh, I believe there's also a... Nicholas, what was that thing you were telling me before? A friend of mine was telling me about some kind of throttling. Is there some kind of throttling in Syslog NG now? I was too lazy to write this down, so. Yeah, you can have a target every X minutes to tell you how many packets it lost and to I found you that it's still alive. Thanks a lot. Okay, not actually throttling, but you can have it tell you statistics about how many packets it drops if, in fact, it does wind up having to drop packets. That's something that syslog won't do. If syslog drops packets, you know, remote log packets, you never even know about it. Okay. I could go on and on about syslog ng. It's really groovy, and Bashi is such a sweet guy. But I'm going to go on and talk about automated log watchers. Um, the payoff, as it were, of the technique. Once you've figured out what to look for, you can configure some other application to look for it for you. Um, the one that I cover in the log chapter in my book is uh, S-Watch or Swatch, the simple watcher. I don't know if I like Swatch as much as I used to. For one thing, it hasn't been updated since like 2000. For another, being a Perl script, it's got a certain amount of overhead associated with it. Thank you. Um, and I was running it on this machine this morning. This thing is, uh, I think, a Pentium 266. And I was really shocked by the CPU hit that I took from running, from running Swatch. Um, I, I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from examining Swatch because it's one of a fairly small number of tools that will um, watch um, a log file in real time, you know, that will basically tail a log file and watch it for um, specific strings. Um, but what I, do want you to under, what I do want you to know is that your mileage may vary. Don't go, 
don't throw a swatch on a production system, configure it, and leave it running overnight and hope for the best. Um, bench test it first and make sure that it doesn't have any deleterious effects on your system. I mean, you want to do that anyhow because it's got a really fussy configuration syntax. And I mean, if you just type some stuff and fire it up, it may or may not work the way you intend it to. Um, the good news is that the, uh, the Linux distros each come with their own log watchers of various types. Red Hat now has got one called LogWatch. I'm told that there's uh, a different tool by the same name that's older. That one I don't know. I have some familiar, familiarity with Red Hat's LogWatch. LogWatch is cool because unlike Swatch, it has its own brains. It has its own rules for things that constitute log weirdness. And, you can, and it's customizable, of course, as well. Um, Log Digest is SUSE's equivalent of that. And it, it does not tail an active log file. It runs as a cron job. In other words, it's a script that you run once in a while to parse your logs and report on any weirdness that it finds. Um, it's not very well documented, but it's a really easy script to reverse engineer, even if you don't know Perl. Or, I mean, even if, well, no, it's not in Perl. Never mind. It's easy to reverse engineer. Um, every, all of the configuration information is kept in Etsy Log Digest. Um, the interesting files there are ignore, which is where you can specify strings that it should ignore if it sees. And then the other one is, oh, uh, let's see. I'm spacing out what it's called. Oh, wait, I wrote it down. And I misplaced the notepad. Alarming. Alarming. That's the name of the file. That's where you look for stuff that is alarming. So if I cat that file... Oh, shoot. Bear with me here. Okay. This is where you can specify strings that you want log digest to look for. Oh, cool. Okay, thanks. Yes, we'll haul out this way. Okay. So, now it's time to open the floor to beating up on this box. Um, I've got, oh, wow, there's some strange stuff in my log right now. Holy cow. That's the most juicy invalid method request I've ever, ever seen. Can you see that on the bottom? Did anybody here perpetrate that? Because if they did, that's worth a prize. Beg your pardon? Oh, really? I'm, s I'm not entirely parsing you. Something about w the, the second layer? Oh, are you getting me? Are you doing it? I'm, I'm basically trying to flood you with uh, uh, misconfigure with my formed uh, layer two frames, in this case using FATA jack, hair jack. Oh. So I wonder if that can produce anything, and I also wondered if I can sneak under the uh, login in your case. So I don't know, maybe just noise, maybe it's a ref noise which, which does it. Yes, yes. Layer two attacks. Well, um, the gentleman said that what he's doing is he's sending me malformed packets. And so he's wondering if it's maybe, maybe if it caused that message, maybe if it's uh, sneaking under my radar. And the answer to that is malformed packets and layer two attacks constitute denial of service, and I'm not going to give any prizes for that. So. <laughs> Well, okay, consolation prize, fine. The consolation prize is an ESPA SCSI interface with a black and, oh no, a GX frame buffer. Hot damn. There. Are you happy now? Are you happy, kids? That's the only DOS attempt that I'm going to give prizes for, though. I've got my, I've got my morals. Huh? 
Hmm? Oh, yeah, you could give them out. Sure, sure. What else we got here? Oh, I've got some undersized frame, frames received. I think that was the same thing. 192, 168, 77, 4. Oh, that's a broadcast. Okay, never mind that. And in case you missed it, my victim host is located at 10.25.25.2 with a Class C subnet mask and an ESS ID of Wuzzala. W-U-Z-Z-A-L-A. I see. You're right, my terminal got corrupted somehow. Okay, there we go. Thank you. That hasn't happened to me like in three years. I totally missed that. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. Okay, who said that? Who's 25.69? Someone gets a prize for complimenting the kilt. All right. Oh, yes, I know him. A prize over there. Raise your hand again, please, so the goon can spot you. Right over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How could you tell? <laughs> How could you tell if it were broken? I'm not even sure what that is. Is that a repeater of some kind? Hmm? Ooh, cool. Prizes, by the way, were, lo were donated by Uncle Ira from um, Miko. So buy stuff from Uncle Ira. Very cool guy. Okay, so what else here? These are all from 25.69. Is that all you, Tony? Oh, wait, there was something fairly involved. Oh, yeah, that was Tony also. Man, you were really going to town, man. Did you root me? Uh, I've only got two minutes. You've got two minutes left to gain a prize. Come on, have at it. i got junk to give away here. Okay. Be that way. Um, so then, maybe I'll ask a trivia question. Okay. What is the list price of my book? No, that's lame. Never mind. I retract it. Oh, wait. Yes, sir. Forty-four ninety-five. Yes, Jay Beal gets a prize for answering the lamest trivia question at DEF CON ever. <laughs> what the hell is this? What the fuck is this? Jay, it does whatever you're elite enough to figure out it does. That's what it does. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Okay, who's twenty-five dot? Who's got twenty-five dot seventy seventy-nine? Who's twenty-five dot seventy-nine? Yes, we've got a lucky winner. All right. <laughs> and I'm quite delighted to end my talk on that note. Thank you very much. <laughs>